all the games I used to play in my younger wilder days. The games of clubs and tees that never crossed my mind. But after some discussion with my closest, dearest friends, I decided that I'd give it one good try. Welcome in to another episode of The Turn. I am Joe Nosley. It's great to be here with you. Uh, we don't have Andrew Putters here with us today, uh, so I'm filling in. Andrew had uh, kind of a hectic schedule at work this week, uh, kind of some uh, crazy st- stuff thrown his way, so uh, I'll be stepping in for him. Won't do nearly as good a job as he does, but appreciate you guys coming in with us. we got a big show, a uh, very special guest, a good friend of mine, colleague over at Roto Baller, Spencer Aguiar. Spencer, how you doing, man? Good to see you. Thank you for being here. Uh, tell us a little bit what's going on over at Roto Baller. Yeah, I'm doing great, Joe. Thanks for having me on again. You know, we have just about anything you can think of at Roto Baller. I write a DraftKings piece where I touch on my favorite, you know, plays for the week, a Vegas report where I cover my my top wagers, a showdown article where I provide in tournament and pre-tournament stats. That model is set up in a way for you to weigh any combination of data when you make a copy. I also provide a pre-tournament model in my DK piece that allows you to fully customize the sheet for research. You know, that's probably one of my favorite things I do because it gives a user a chance to use my database for DraftKings betting, et cetera. So uh, my code is tee off for that. And, you know, it's a pleasure to do the show again with you, Joe. It's uh, this should be a good one. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Uh, we miss Andrew, but but really fortunate that you could step in. You did the Masters with us last last week and just crushed it. So uh, really glad you're back. Um, speaking of the Masters, we had a couple things going on, uh, kind of doing our, our hat giveaway. We've had a lot of fun with that. We did one for the players, uh, did one last week for the Masters. You guys came through huge. We had a ton of demand for those, and I think we've got like two left, maybe three. Um, so if anybody wants to buy one of those, just hit us up on uh, Twitter at the turn golf pod, or you can hit me up at Joe nicely and, uh, we'll kind of do first come first serve on those last couple. Um, but we're going to do a drawing for a free one. I'm going to pull that out now. So here we go. And the winner is at Eric M Savage. So Eric Savage, you are getting a master's edition turn hat uh we'll hit you up on on twitter and get your info and we'll get that out to you uh we appreciate appreciate everybody entering uh we went over 100 100 subscribers on youtube andrew sent me a text today and let me know that the masters was our most downloaded episode ever uh so we're really excited about that and appreciate you guys checking it out as for the master spencer it was a good one man i wouldn't say a shocking winner in hideki matsuyama but certainly kind of a surprising one um, kind of a dark horse for me, a player that I, I found my way to as the week progressed. We touched on him on the show last week. Um, I wrote him up in my core four as a GPP pivot. Um, I felt like with his ownership and kind of his track record at Augusta, uh, certainly, you know, didn't, didn't predict him to win the tournament, but felt like he was a great DFS play. Um, really emotional win for him, huge win for international golf, uh, for kind of the, the Asian uh, portion of the world. Um, This is what the Masters set out to do several years ago uh, by kind of trying to grow the game globally. Um, So so a very, very big win for golf as a whole, big win for Hideki. We know he's kind of been capable of this. We we haven't seen a major from him, but uh, so certainly not a shocker, but but certainly surprising with how he's played this year. Um, Give me your thoughts on Hideki, man, and kind of your thoughts in general on the Masters. Uh, let me know what you're thinking on that, Spencer. Yeah, you know, Hideki, if you look at this 10 years ago, when he first came on the scene, he was a low amateur at the Masters. You know, he kind of had that career trajectory I think we were looking at of, you know, Morikawa went in and won a major so soon with it. You have guys like Hovland that are, you know, competing in majors weekly and or yearly with it. And Hideki's just an interesting case study here. Like it took him a little bit longer to put it all together. The last, you know, three, four years, he's kind of had a hard time finding the winner's circle, but he's that upper echelon pedigree of a golfer. Like, you know, if five years ago he would have won one, I don't think it would have been a major shock to anybody in the community that he pulled it off. He's a pristine ball striker. You know, I think the putting is what usually holds him back. And he was a positive putter at the Masters this week. His around the green game was historic. I mean, he was getting up and down from everywhere. So, 
you know, it's a long overdue victory for him. And it was nice to see him pull it off. I think that he's a guy that, as I said, this probably should have happened a couple of years ago and, and we'll see where he can go from here. Sometimes these guys, when they get their first major, they can start, you know, running some off here. And a lot of the pressure on that Japan puts on him will probably be off his shoulders. And now he can go and play these tournaments with a little more carefree attitude. And, you know, if he wins a couple more, it's not going to surprise me. He's that type of a player. Yeah, for sure, man. Um, you know, those of us in the DFS industry have kind of known for years, uh, you know, just how great of a ball, st- ball striker Hideki is. Um, and the, the concern's always been the putting. Um, he's always been underrated around the green. Uh, I thought he played beautifully around the green last week. Um, and kind of that, that stretch, the back nine, where when they came back from that rain delay Saturday, um, maybe one of the most inspired, uh, most, uh, impressive nine hole stretches of golf I've seen. Uh, I think he went six under over his last eight, uh, at Augusta national. So we knew the talent was there. We knew the ball striking was there. Um, you know, the putter has always kind of held him back as well as kind of, you feel the pressure maybe that's, that's put on him from Japan. He's extremely popular over there. Um, as you mentioned, man, maybe this will open the door for him, uh, to kind of get going and win some more majors, but certainly a huge benchmark victory for him. Uh, other thoughts, Spencer, uh, Jordan Spieth played really well. We, we thought he would and he, and he did, uh, certainly disappoint, didn't disappoint, just couldn't quite get the putter going like he needed to. I, I think Saturday was, was tough for him. Uh, JT was a big letdown for me, uh, with, with of course the triple bogey there Saturday. Um, and Xander, man, we, you know, we don't want to kind of pile on, but, uh, certainly hung tough, bounced back from a rocky start, um, to, to kind of tip off Sunday, but made, made four birdies in a row to get back in it. But then when he needed a shot the most, he pulled one in the water on 16 Spencer, you and I were talking uh, before we started recording and I don't ever remember a player uh, hitting it in the water on 16 on a Sunday. Uh, You you just do not do that. That that's lay it out right all day. The miss is right. Um, You know, hope it feeds back. Uh, So it just, just a bad line and a bad swing. And uh, you you mentioned that it's kind of the same miss he had at Phoenix earlier this year at the Waste Management. Uh, is that right? That's that's what you were saying? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we keep seeing this from Xander. Is like, you know, he, he's as explosive as anybody in golf. And it's just he puts himself in these situations where he makes some mistakes. He puts himself behind the eight ball. And then as we saw on the back nine, he started firing himself back into the tournament. He puts himself with a real opportunity to win. And as you said, like, Nobody misses that shot on 16 into the water. That's such an easy ball that you can just have it funnel back to the hole. Like I get, he's trying to throw a dart there and he's trying to make something happen. So I don't want to pile on him. Like clearly he's attempting to win a golf tournament, which is more than we can say about a lot of players, but it's just a disappointing miss. We've seen it way too many times from him recently. I I think it's starting to get into his head a little bit. I think, you know, when it happens over and over and over again, you're, you're hearing him like be disappointed by it. Sure. It's going to turn around. He has victories on tour. It's not that he's incapable of winning, but it's in his head right now. And we're seeing it transpire weekly when he puts himself in these positions that things are not going right. As you said, with speed, like I pretty much what I expected from him, he just didn't make enough putts to actually win the tournament. I, I think if he could have been at seven under entering Sunday, I think that probably would have been the most likely threat to Hideki. You know, nobody made quite the push to give the put the pressure on Hideki the way that it needed to be. As you mentioned on Saturday on the back nine, Hideki kind of won that tournament and was able to hold on on Sunday for the rest of the day. And Zalatoris made a push like he's a Zalatoris is a superstar in the making here, and he's going to be somebody who's going to be a major winner before long. But you know, I think other than you know Xander and Zalatoris, I think Rose faltered early. I think Leishman faltered early, and. For the most part, like, yeah, Zalatoris birdied the first two and Hideki made that slight error to start, but that really never got that close to where you felt like Hideki was going to lose the tournament. Closest was probably when Xander got to 16 and you thought, well, maybe Hideki will make a mistake. Maybe Xander can make another birdie or two, but, you know, Xander makes the big error and all of a sudden it's like right back to where we were and Hideki kind of just cruise controls into the winner's circle at that point. Yeah. Yeah. He he played smart golf on the back nine, uh, kind of limited mistakes. He knew he had a little wiggle room to work with and and certainly took advantage of that. Played, uh, played a really smart shot. I thought, 
you know, after the mistake on 15 in that long, played a really smart chip shot there, uh, kind of took his medicine with bogey and, and all credit to Hideki, man. He, he played beautifully, uh, won the tournament and, and held up under all that pressure. So, you know, hats off to Hideki, uh, a, a player you mentioned, uh, he's kind of a pet player of mine. We talked about him on here last week. Will Zalatoris, Willie Z. The bandwagon's getting pretty full, Spencer. Uh, I, I feel like we, uh, a couple of us started out uh, kind of on this Willie Z Express last year, and uh, it, there were only a few of us kind of driving the train, and now it's overflowing, um, with, which is kind of a really nice segue into this week in the RBC Heritage. Uh, Zalatoris is going to be teeing it up this week. We're heading to Hilton Head. Um, one of my favorite tournaments. I know it's one of Andrew's favorite tournaments. Um, we're, uh, of course, in Knoxville, Tennessee, kind of in the southeast. Uh, both of us vacationed at Hilton Head several times and kind of familiar with Harbor Town, the Sea Pines area. Just really, really beautiful over there. Love seeing the golf course on TV. Uh, and it's a really unique golf course uh, for the PGA Tour. One of the shorter layouts on the PGA Tour. Uh, just a little over 7,100 yards, I believe. It'll be playing this week. It's a par 71. Uh, Pete Dye track, uh, which we'll, we're familiar with Pete Dye's designs. We saw one just a few weeks ago at the Players' Championship. Uh, we see one at the Travelers every year. See uh, the stadium course there at, at the Amex uh, and several others. He's, he's a well-known architect. Um, tree line fairways. Uh, and, and it's one of those weeks, Spencer, one of the very few weeks on the PGA Tour schedule where uh, I feel like we can basically kind of cross driving distance off the list, man. Uh, give me your thoughts on uh, Harbor Town uh, Heritage. What are you thinking about the golf course this week, and what what are you kind of looking for uh, as far as this golf course goes? Yeah, I mean, as you mentioned, uh, driving distance is at most Pete Dye courses. You're going to have that strategical layout where you need to miss to the correct location. As you mentioned, you have tree line fairways. That will help disguise some of the wind, but it also creates a blockage if you don't find the short grass with it. So it's very important to not pull your tee shots. So you're going to see guys lay up. It, the random coastal gusts and sand traps are looming around every corner. And the venue features some of the smallest greens on tour, which emphasizes GIR percentage, strokes gained around the green, scrambling. I think all those things will be important. And then you also have 11 par fours, nine of which measure between 400 to 500 yards so you know I for my model this week I have a little bit of uh, strokes gain total on Pete Dye I put some strokes gain total on Bermuda little strokes gain total on moderate to severe wind I think those are three things that you can kind of try to find specialists there I have a weighted par four where I took the key ranges for the week uh, attached 20% weight onto that little around the green and sand save weighted ball striking which is geared more towards the accuracy as we talked about and then proximity from 125 to 200 yards. I think that that's kind of your, your key ranges you should be looking at. Uh, you know, I put 30% on the 125, 150, 33% on the 150, 175, 37% on the 175, 200 uh, for a total of 15% there. So I, I think it's, you know, that's a pretty even mix there of what you're looking for. And when anytime you take distance out of the equation, it opens up the field for who can win. I mean, when we look at the past winners here, yeah, Webb Simpson last year is an elite player. He's not necessarily somebody you think of for distance. You have CT Pan in 2019, Satoshi Kadaira in 2018, Wesley Bryan in 2017, Brandon Grace in 2016. So that's not necessarily the players you think of, of these like, you know, bomb and gouge. These are guys that are mostly short hitters that can find some sort of a sustained success and wind. And you know, I think when you can find that template for a golfer, that's kind of what we should be looking for this week. Yeah, for sure, man. Um, totally love everything you said. Um, really, really focused on that that proximity from 150 to 200 plus and up, really myself. Um, strokes gained approach, overall proximity uh, around the green. I'll be giving a little bit more weight to this week um, than normal, uh, especially with, you know, giving very, very little weight to the strokes gained off the tee. So, <clears throat> really love where you're at with that man uh yeah and, and like you said this is one of those golf courses we, we really only see a handful a year anymore uh where basically the entire field's in play right um with, with driving distance um uh, being of very little importance kind of brings everybody uh, uh you know into the ball game so to speak and, and we've seen that as you mentioned some of the winners we've seen here ct pan satoshi Kadira, uh wesley Bryan. i mean 
uh, web one last year in a stack field. But, uh, you know, in the past, we've seen kind of random guys pop up and be able to win this event, you know, thanks to a hot putter. And, and with distance not needed, it's it's certainly possible for everybody in this field to uh, make a run. But uh, <clears throat> this is a very strong field. Um, I, I like the salary scale this week. Uh, we saw a stack field last week. I think this was or last year. I think this was the uh, second tournament back after the restart. So we saw just a just a pack field. It's when all those guys were playing every tournament pretty much. Um, but this 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 what year's field's really really good. Uh, we're seeing a strong strong turnout uh, for Hilton Head this year. Bryson DeChambeau withdrew today. Uh, we're doing this Monday night, and he withdrew earlier today. So Bryson's out of there. Um, but other than that, we we got a really strong salary scale. And let's just dive into it, Spencer. Let's jump into DraftKings. Um, we've only got one player this week above 11K. That's DJ up at 11.6. And then we've got five guys above 10K. Patrick Cantlay at 10.9. Uh, Webb, defending champ, at 10.7. Colin Morikawa making his second RBC Heritage start, 10.5. Cam Smith, the guy we love, at 10.2. And then Daniel Berger coming off a kind of a disappointing miscut last week at the Masters, man. Uh, tell me what you're thinking up at the top this week, Spencer. Um, it, it's kind of tough to swallow this DJ 11-6 price tag with kind of how he's looked, man. I, I was I was hopeful DJ might find something last week, but he certainly didn't continue to look sluggish. Um, so, so I'm having a hard time swallowing this 11-6 tag, man. What are you thinking on DJ and kind of the rest of the guys above 10K? I mean, the one thing I will say about Dustin, if we're trying to look from a contrarian approach here, the price tag and form are going to have everybody looking elsewhere. I, I like, as of right now, it's looking like about 7% ownership for him. I, I think it might be a mistake to completely get rid of him from your player pool. And it might be more of an MME type thing. You know, I don't know if you need to go there in single entries and three maxes, but if you're playing in any of these really large tournaments, I do think that you can find a contrarian approach with Dustin. We know his upside's as good as anybody on tour. You know, it wouldn't shock me if he's able to turn it around here. Cantley feels playable across the board. He has a third, seventh, and third in his three starts. The Masters missed cut will probably marginally lower his ownership, but really good fit for him here. Webb is probably the safest choice if we're trying to look in that direction. He's going to be the most popular in my opinion, but He's first in my model for strokes gain total on Bermuda, uh, strokes gain total on win, and par four scoring. Morikawa is probably the guy that kind of more in the, the line of where Dustin is with it. I, I think he's a strong GPP target because of his irons and accuracy. little too dangerous for me in cash games. Don't think you need to quite go there. But he has immense upside to pull it off. You know, he has four victories in a little over 40 tournaments. The, the downside would be he only has one top 15 in his last 10 uh starts in PGA tour action as far as uh, 10 weekly starts, not his last 10 starts. And then Daniel Berger, you know, it's kind of the same thing as Cantlay. I think the perception is, is that, you know, he missed the cut. I don't know if we're looking at 13, 14% right now, but he always performs better on short precision tests. Kind of reminds me a little bit of, he missed the cut at the uh, waste management. Then he goes the next week and wins Pebble beach at a course that just suited him a little bit better. I think this is a really good test for him that seems to suit his game. Like from a, from a safety aspect, I would say Webb and Berger are probably the two safest. If you're looking to be outside the box, it's probably Dustin. And then Cantlay's playable across the board. Cam Smith might be the one guy that I'm a little bit worried about. He has no top 25s here in four tries, uh, but you can make a GPP argument. Like we're looking at less than 5% ownership. You can always, you know, kind of fit some of these guys that are in good form uh, at the right ownership total. So I think you have a really good group here. Like there's some weeks where the $9,000 range, maybe you want to start there. I don't think that's, this is one of those weeks. I think all, all players above 10,000 makes sense. And I, and I think that uh, it just comes down to where exactly you want to go and what kind of contest you're playing in. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, totally agree. I, I feel like you can go here if you want to um, do, just a couple thoughts on, as far as DJ goes, I just don't know that I'm willing to pull the trigger at that price tag uh, at a at a golf course that maybe doesn't suit his strengths anyway. Um, even when he's in great form, he's played played good enough here. T17, T28, T16, his last three starts. Um, he's an RBC heritage RBC guy, um, which kind of makes you feel like that's you know it's almost an obligation that he's playing this tournament. Um, so I hear where you're where you're coming from as far as DJ being a 
you know, kind of an intriguing GPP option, but, you know, I just don't know that I'll get there myself this week. Cantley's interesting to me. Has played extremely well at this golf course, a T3, T7, and T3 last three starts here. Didn't play it last year, but man, that was, I was so surprised by, by his play last week, Spencer. I know you liked him. I did as well. I'm, I'm a huge Cantley fan, but, you know, maybe we can catch him in a little bit lower ownership coming off that missed cut. Like you said, he missed the cut at the players as well. So you wonder if it's just a little mini funk he's in, uh, and this is a place where he's comfortable and can kind of get back on his feet. Webb, I agree, is the safest play up here. Uh, I have no problem at all starting with Webb. But maybe my favorite um, play up here is Colin Morikawa at 10-5. Um, only has one career start, played it last year, and, and only had a T-64. Um, but, you know, if we remember Spencer, he was coming off that kind of that heartbreaking loss to Daniel Berger um, at Colonial, uh, the, the first start back since the restart. Um, so I'm willing to give him a little bit of leeway there. Um, but his ball striking should be a huge asset on this golf course. There are question marks about his short game, yes, um, but we saw him, you know, just just perform a surgical victory at concession, you know, a few weeks ago, a, a golf course that that's very, very tricky around the green. And, and anytime you're, you're talking about, you know, the smallest greens on the PGA Tour schedule, which is what we're looking at this week, um, I'll take Colin Morikow on my team anytime in that situation. Um, but as we go on down below 10, man, I, I feel that the 9K range is really, really fertile ground this week. Will Zalatoris, you have to figure his ownership is going to balloon, um, even though his price has dramatically increased versus last week. I believe he's 7,300. Now he's up to 9.7. Um, and you have to feel that he'll be extremely popular after that outing. Um, he's certainly no longer under the radar. Um, you know, those, those days are kind of gone for us now. Um, and we just have to decide if we want to go with that talent. Terrell, Terrell Hatton finally kind of cracked the code at Augusta last week, um, had his best career finish uh, in the Masters last week and had a T3 on this golf course last year. Um, I feel that this this golf course fits him very, very well. Corey Conner, Connors is a great ball striker, had a top 25 here last year after missing a couple cuts. Paul Casey's just classy, and Matthew Fitzpatrick uh, has kind of made it well known that this is maybe his favorite golf course on the PGA Tour schedule. This feels like the type of track where he can be successful. Um, so tell me what you're thinking here in the nine, Spencer. It feels like all these guys are really solid options. Yeah, you know, I, I think when we look at Connors and Zalatoris, my two concerns with them is they have played so much golf in the last 10 weeks, and that's before we even account for they were in contention to win at Augusta. And, and as you said, Zalatoris isn't quite the same $7,000 option that he's been, you know, these past couple of weeks. Now we're looking at him as one of the top tier guys. Not, not a reason to fade him. I, I think more of the reason that I am concerned just is with all the golf that those two guys have played. As you said, Casey is about as classy as you're going to get. Only concern I have with him. I mean, you could make an argument that he's on the wrong side of what he was performing with. Like he had six straight top 12 results worldwide. His last two is a 28th at the match play, 26th at the Masters. I don't think that's a reason to, to fade him. But, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's at least something to point out with it. You take a guy like Sung Jae, those irons continue to be bad. Like, we saw it at the Masters. We've kind of seen it. When you put him on Bermuda, he's able to turn it around. I think that putter is going to have to get scorching hot for him, and I wouldn't put it past him. But, you know, I'm a little bit concerned with where his game's at at this point. And then, Probably the two guys that I like the most in this range would be Fitzpatrick and Hatton. As you said, I mean, Fitzpatrick, this has been the course that he's kind of alluded to is the course that's one of his favorite on tour. Anytime you remove distance from the equation, Fitzpatrick comes into play. I think he's a perfectly acceptable option for cash games. I think he has some GPP upside to him. And then Hatton would probably be a guy I would be a little bit more intrigued with in GPP than cash. Like when we look at what he's done here, he had the third last year, which he made every single putt. Uh, he missed the cut in 2018, 20, uh, 29th and 2017. If we look at what he's done recently, the 18th at the Masters was like the best form we've seen in a while. It's the first time he's cracked the code at, at Augusta. The match play result was, you know, one of the worst in the field. He missed the cut at the players. I still think there's a little bit of volatility around him, but I think he is a good GPP target to potentially look at. Yeah, man. Uh, sounds like we're pretty well in lockstep in this range, Spencer. Uh, Terrell Hatton just seems like a guy you can never trust. I know he's played extremely well over the past 
12 to 18 months. Um, and I do like him in GPPs, as you mentioned, but man, he just seems like a guy that's kind of all over the place at times. Um, we'll see some really good rounds and some really just puzzlingly bad rounds from him. So I'm with you on him more as a GPP slant there. Uh, Willie Z, man, yeah, you're right. The the kid has played a ton of golf. I think since the end of January, uh, he's played eight times, uh, which, you know, obviously he's a young guy, but you have to imagine that that run just emotionally, emotionally and physically last week took a lot out of him, you would think. Um, so I could, I could very well see him coming out this week and just being flat, kind of being out of gas. Um, the flip side of that coin is, you know, maybe last week's uh, run, springboards him maybe he gets his first pga tour victory this week we know we know it's coming at some point so you know i think you certainly uh can consider willie z there uh even though i, I would keep a close eye on his ownership um, but but fitz just seems rock solid um you know you, you question the upside maybe a touch but you also feel like a win's coming for him at some point and i'm just completely off sung jay at this point man we talked about him last week i was i was pretty low on him at the masters and and i'm there again as well but uh, right below Sung Jay, a player I really, really liked this week. A guy I had ended up with a lot of exposure to last week is Abraham Answer um, at 8,900. And he got a second in this tournament last year, Spencer. And he he hit his irons just about as well as anybody could last year in this golf tournament. Uh, just just unbelievably sharp. Um, and we've seen some good play from him lately. Um, playing really solid golf, and I love the iron play. Tommy Fleetwood uh, just doesn't seem to be back to where – we're, we're kind of used to seeing him for several years. Brian Harmon is an intriguing veteran on this golf course. This this course, I wouldn't say it's like Augusta National, but I, I would uh, kind of give a bump to guys with experience here. There's some little nuances to this course, um, especially where you want to leave yourself off the tee. It's obviously a peak die track. It's a second shot golf course. Uh, Brian Harmon's got a ton of experience here, knows how to play it well, and he's in great form. Uh, Sergio had a T5 last year, a uh, great ball striker. Then you get down into guys like Lowry, English, Lee Westwood, Billy Horschel, Kevin Naw, Cooch, uh, course history beast. Give me your thoughts on this 8K range, uh, Spencer. I really like answer. Um, Harmon seems to stick out, even though this price is a little bit high. Uh, I was hoping to see him kind of down at around 8K, but give me your thoughts on this range, man. Anybody jumping out to you? Any, any must plays in there for you? Yeah, I, this, see, like, kind of when I'm looking at it, like, I kind of want to be in the $10,000 range and then the $8,000 range. Like, maybe aside from, as we mentioned, Hatton and Fitzpatrick, I'm kind of bypassing the 9,000s to go to the 8,000s. I, I think my biggest question with answer, which I, I am curious to hear your opinion on this uh, after I get done, is, you know, I guess there's two frames of mind with answer. Number one would be, should ownership be secondary because he's a, an immaculate fit for this course? And, and we know that, as you said, like last year, I don't know if anybody's ever struck their irons the way he did and not, did not win the golf tournament. Like he missed every single putt throughout the whole week and, you know, found a way to not win the tournament. But then the second thing would be, does answers lack of win equity decrease his playability at over 20%? And it's a tough thing to go with. Like, I mean, if we're talking about really big tournaments here, like if we look at his, his course or we look at his current form, 26 at the masters, 23rd at Valero, 18th at match play, 22nd at players, 18th at concession. Like those are all really good results, but that to me is more of like a cash game target than a guy that can win a tournament. So, you know, if he's not going to win the tournament, I worry a little bit about playing him in these really large fields. Like I think he's a perfect fit for cash games. I think he's a perfect fit for single entries and three maxes. I just don't know in these 150 type lineup contests if he makes total sense there. I mean, I think you have to believe he's going to win it to come to that conclusion. And if and if that's the conclusion you come to, I think that it's a reasonable one. It's just I'm having a, a little bit of a difficult time there. And then when I look lower than that, like there's just so many options I like in this range. I actually like Tommy Fleetwood this week. He popped off pretty much across the board in everything I looked at. He was 12th in his last 50 on it on Pete Dye. He was ninth on Bermuda in his last 50, ninth in his last 50 in strokes gain and moderate to severe win. He's third in my weighted par four for his last 50 rounds. And he's also 20th in around the green and sand save. As you mentioned with Harmon, I think until like, I mean, as long as it's going to click and it seems to still be clicking for him, it's hard to ignore him. I think he's another guy that you could say is kind of the answer thing that 
He doesn't necessarily win golf tournaments if the ownership starts creeping over 15%. Maybe he's more of a cash game play. I, I really like Sergio. I think that his ball striking can find success here. I think Lowry, we've seen him turn it around recently, the eighth at the players. His 36 at the Honda was much better than that. He fell apart on the weekend, the 21st at the Masters. Harris English, this is the kind of course you would expect him to find success on. He has three top 32s in his last three attempts here. In 21st at the Masters, his game seems to be clicking. I mean, I guess Wes would be, would be the one guy that I'm not usually on. Horschel would have to be some sort of a GPP contrarian type play. I mean, if we looking at a 2% version of him, maybe. And then we go a little bit lower. I do like Kevin Non, Matt Kuchar. I just think the course history for Kuchar is tough to ignore. I'm willing to throw out the Masters. He has two top 12s in his two prior starts to that. And Kevin Naw has two top 10s here in his last four. So it's just a really robust range for me that I think there's a lot of ways you can go. I wouldn't fault anybody really for going any direction with it. It's just when I look at the answer thing, I kind of like pivoting in, in these really large fields when possible. And I think you have, I mean, answer has not won a PGA tour event. Fleetwood has not won a PGA tour event. Like you kind of have a lot of these guys that fit that same narrative here. And if I can get, you know, 7% on Fleetwood versus 21% on answer, if we're talking about some of these, you know, 10,000 person contests, like I don't mind going in that direction. And, and I also don't mind being overweight on answer. If you're going to play him in single entry and three max in the same breath with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you kind of took the words right out of my mouth there with, with answer Spencer. Um, it kind of, kind of goes back to, um, a discussion we had on the show last week concerning Jordan Spieth and, we knew he, that his popular, pop, his ownership was going to be huge. He was going to be extremely popular. Uh, we knew that going in, and and we kind of, you and I and Andrew kind of tossed around, you know, what do we do um, with a player that we like, um, but but that we know is going to be extremely popular. And that's kind of where I feel myself falling with answer this week. Um, I feel like he's kind of a, a, a key component of, of this salary scale, um, and I'll find myself kind of kind of similar to to what we came up with with Jordan Spieth last week, I'll, I'll be significantly overweight or significantly underweight on him. I feel like it's one of those spots where you just have to make a decision, um, kind of make a stand, if you will. Um, I, I'm personally leaning probably going overweight on him uh, to the field, and that's kind of scary because you bring up the lack of wins, but you know he's he's got a second here. Um, has a couple of top fives at the Amex, which is also a Pete Dye track, a couple of top tens at the Travelers, a Pete Dye track, some some good finishes at the Players, uh, a Pete Dye track. So, you know, it's kind of one of those things where all the factors are, are pointing to a good performance from him. Um, but, but I agree. I, I wouldn't want to be even with the field on him and GPPs. You know, if you're trying to take down a, you know, a huge large field tournament, you can certainly look at pivots there. Tommy Fleetwood's an interesting one. Um, kind of, as you mentioned, it feels like there's a ton of quality in this range, uh, but maybe not a ton of GPP upside. Uh, you, you, you talked about guys like Kevin Na and Matt Kuchar. I very rarely play Kevin Na myself. That's kind of just a personal decision, but this is the type of track where he can compete. Um, and, and as we get down in the sevens, we'll, we'll talk about a couple more veterans kind of in that same spot. Uh, as Na and Kuchar, you know, this is one maybe they circle on the counter that they they feel like they really have a chance to win. Um, I feel like there's some some quality here in the sevens. Um, you know, it's oftentimes a range where you don't really know what you're going to get. Um, if it feels like some weeks you're kind of uh, struggling to find a, just a guy or two that you're willing to really get behind. But this week, uh, a lot of quality in there, a lot of intriguing players, um, you know, especially when you start talking about, you know, tournament winning GPP winning upside. Uh, I think a guy like Russell Henley, who's a terrific ball striker, um, not quite been there for him this year like we saw in, in 2020. Siwoo Kim, uh, a guy that I was, you know, heavily invested in last week. I listed him as a GPP pivot in my core four, and he played really, really well, um, and, and he's played well here. Has a runner-up, I believe. He's missed his last couple of cuts here, but, you know, Siwoo's game long is always kind of tricky when you start diving into that because there's there's really peaks and valleys to his game and I feel like he's playing really well right now so certainly willing to give Siwoo a look Charlie Hoffman's a guy that we you know kind of we're all targeting at Valero he came through played really well had a runner up there and then kind of didn't get to play the Masters which bummed everybody out those first round leader bets didn't get to uh, go down on Charlie Hoffman this year but 
Kisner kind of in that Kevin Nam mold. He's been he's been a course history beast. This this is a track that he can play. Uh, Brandon Grace, a former winner here. Ian Poulter has been unbelievable here. Matt Wallace, these guys, you know, there's a handful of events a year, like I said, Spencer, that they're kind of circling on the calendar, and you have to feel that this is one of them. Veteran experience matters here. Distance does not matter here. So give me your thoughts on some of these vets uh, as we get down into the sevens. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of these guys, mostly in the upper part of the $7,000 range, like there's not that big of a discrepancy for me between these guys and even some of the guys in, you know, the mid to lower 9,000s. Um, you know, Russell Henley, his approach game is so elite. You know, when we look at what he's done here recently, it's back-to-back -back missed cuts. But anytime we're looking at a venue where irons are going to come into play and accuracy, Bermuda grass, like Henley makes sense. Si Wu is the ultimate boomer bust type of target. Put him on Pete Dye. He usually has success. As you mentioned, he's missed the last two cuts here. But, you know, 12th at the Masters. He showed some good form there. 23rd at Valero. He seems to be peaking. Hoffman is bringing good form into the week. I mean, the one guy that is confusing to me is probably Robert McIntyre. Like, I don't think I can go there. I'd rather be late to the party on him. I think that this course takes away a lot of his strengths. I think we're, you know, I think he's a big hitter that if you put him on something to where he can, you know, take advantage of that. That's probably a better test for him. I really like Christian Bezadenhout. I think his short game can really find success here. He was 28th here last year. He's the number one player in my model this week around the green top five in putting and 11th in proximity from 125 to 200 yards. As you mentioned with Kisner, this is a really good course for him where I think he's coming in under the radar from some of the recent form he has. He has two top 11s here in his last four. He's uh, eighth in my model for driving accuracy. Take a guy like Ian Poulter, as you said, he has four straight top 14s at Harvard town. I mean, like he is about as good on this course as you can find. And if we drop just a little bit lower, one of my favorite plays is Kevin Streelman. It's that same mold of a guy who, you know, is not the longest off the tee. We see him find success at courses like Pebble Beach. I think a course like this also fits into that mold for him. He has a miscut here last year. But the one thing I would say about that is it was the second tournament back from COVID. You know, I don't know where these guys were with their form. He has a sixth year in 2019, seventh in 2018. I think those stats would be a little bit more indicative of what, what I would expect from him. He's ninth in my database for weighted par four scoring and 12th in ball striking. So I think you can find a lot of guys down in this range that just have more win equity than the perception is around them. And anytime you play these short courses, like these $7,000 guys that may get negatively affected on these long tracks, definitely come into play. Yeah. Yeah. I agree, man. That's, that's kind of where my mindset is this week as well. I uh, really like, really agree with you on the uh, Bezaden how um, love his short game here, uh, and it, and you know we've mentioned it a couple times. This is a a week lot where I'm bumping around the green play and scrambling, uh, and and he's excellent at that. Uh, Bobby Mack, I, I agree. You know he might he might get a little steam from last week's performance at the Masters, but when you look at what he's been able to do in the U.S. so far, and certainly in very limited starts, but uh, you know he he played well at Augusta nationally, played well at Bay Hill, both those courses are kind of big ballparks like you mentioned uh, i'm afraid that harbor town will kind of uh take away his advantages um and a guy man I'd, I'd be remiss if i didn't uh mention him uh andrew would be irate is a guy that we've we've been on heavily uh, a guy that we really like kind of from our area and that's chris kirk there at 7500 uh we seem to talk him up every week spencer and maybe we wear people out with that but you know, uh, he's played well this year, man. Uh, and, and at 7,500, I, I realize this is a, a fairly solid field, but uh, give me your thoughts on Chris Kirk, man. He's he's gained strokes T to green in his last uh, six starts, I believe. Coming off a of T6 at Valero, he didn't qualify for the Masters, so unfortunately he didn't get to play. But we love him on this show, and, and, I, and I like him again this week. What are your thoughts on Kirk? Yeah, Kirk has been borderline elite here the last couple of months. The 6th at Valero, 25th at Honda, 8th at API, the 16th at Pebble Beach, which is another short track that we're looking at there. He's 5th in my database around the green. He's 19th in approach. He's 16th on Pete Dye tracks. You know, I, I think you're just looking at a golfer that does seem to be very underpriced for his, his skill set. And it's showing unfortunately like he's going to be extremely popular right now looks like he's going to be the fifth most popular play on the board but 
this is an incorrect price 100%. And, and his skills right now, it's kind of like the Brian Harmon thing that we're looking at just with, I, I would say, you know, a thousand dollars less of what you have with Harmon. Like guys like Harmon and Kirk are trending in the right direction right now. And that means people are going to be on them, but it doesn't mean that, you know, all Chad chalk, like Kirk has all the skill set that you would be hoping to find for a venue like this. Yeah, totally agree, man. Um, you know, I, I, I'll be there again. Uh, I just don't see any, any reason to hop off, especially not at this price in this field uh, on a track where he, he can certainly play well. Uh, he, he's just been solid and, Pretty much all aspects. We've seen a couple of bad rounds, a, a, a bad final round dropped him. Uh, what really tanked what was otherwise a great performance at the players. Um, so we've seen some solid play from him, and I think he can play well well again this week. He, he's one of those guys that, you know, kind of to harken back to the answer discussion, I'll probably be overweight on, uh, you know, in comparison to the field, even though he's expected to be popular. Uh, try to gain a little bit of leverage that way. Um, as we work our way down the uh, Kind of round out the sevens. Uh, you mentioned uh, Kevin Strillman, a veteran who I like. I, I kind of had him tagged as well. I'll, I'll toss out Emiliano Grio, um, who's always, you know, unpredictable and trying to hit a moving target. You worry about the putting, but the ball striking uh, is, is certainly interesting. Um, though the around the green game is kind of questionable, but you ca- you kind of got to. I feel like in this field at this price, you kind of got to toss Grio out there. Um, at 7,300, Michael Thompson's a guy I kind of like Spencer. I wrote him up in my horse for the course article this week. Um, played well here recently and, and has good recent form. Doesn't pop statistically. Um, but he's a guy that's pretty solid in those key proximity areas that we talked about earlier, uh, this week, the, uh, 150 to 175, 175 to 200, 200 plus Thompson's pretty solid in all those really good around the green course experience um so give me your thoughts on michael thompson um and and as we move down rounding out the sevens anybody else you're looking at a ct pan uh a jt poston who's got good course history any of those guys popping for you spencer yeah as far as thompson's concerned like yeah i i don't have any glaring weaknesses in my model on him uh you know he has an eighth place in 2020 a 10th place in 2019 we look at his recent form it's pretty good i mean other than the miscut at the genesis which i don't think was a course that necessarily fit his game we're looking at a bunch of top 50s thrown into the mix there i, I like when you're where your mind's at there if i'm looking at the seven thousand three hundred dollar and under range like down to that seven thousand shrillman was my favorite play on the board uh Grio's probably my second favorite play on the board you know a guy like ha- adam hadwin i think makes sense in cash games We've seen him with a 23rd at Valero, 8th at Honda, 29th at the Players. Uh, his last four trips here inside the top 50. CT Pan has his victory in 2019. He seems to be good on this course. You know, other than that, too, uh, he doesn't have a missed cut uh, since uh, I, my database goes back to 2016 on this. But he has uh, all, all made cuts from there. You know, he came third at the Honda. You know, maybe he can continue that run with it. And a guy like Lucas Glover always intrigues me when we talk about ball striking he's one of the better ball strikers. If the putter can get hot, you, you never know. And uh, Poston's, Poston's a tough one for me. I, I never really weigh that much putting when I look at my model. When we look at what he's done here, it's two top eights in the last two years. I think that's a reason to consider him. I think his recent form's been good with it. Um, second in my model in putting. But, you know, when you start getting down into this range, I, I think you're starting to lose the win equity upside. Like, it's difficult to go much lower than this and expect a guy that can actually win. So if I'm looking down in this range, I'm trying to find guys that can make cut guys with a little bit of upside to them. And uh, you know, nobody is that big of a glaring fade for me. I would say, I mean, maybe a guy like Aaron wise, Dylan Fratelli, they they aren't really grading that well for me. I think that both of those guys better suited at a course where they can use their driving, but uh, you know, Alex Noren maybe is another guy that popped for me ever so slightly with it. I, I don't know if I necessarily trust him, but he's a good Bermuda player. He's been relatively solid on Pete Dye tracks. So, you know, that's kind of my favorite plays, I would say, down in that range. And, and when we get down to the 6,000s, like, it starts even shrinking even further than that. So it, it becomes difficult. Like, as, as strong as this tournament is, you do start seeing this uh, diminish as the further you go down. 
Yeah, yeah, I agree, and always to a certain extent, we're going to see that. Um, kind of, kind of what we see in the sixes, though. You know, from week to week, some weeks you feel that you're able to go there. Um, to, to put it simply, in some weeks you you feel that you're not. Um, I feel that this is a week that we can go down there. Um, there are certainly some names we know. Uh, a lot of a lot of familiar players down here, maybe not in the best of form, or, or maybe some with you know questionable course history. Um, one guy that immediately jumps out to me there at sixty nine hundred, Spencer's Doug Gim, uh, who's who's had a really probably underrated year. I would I would say he's had some rough final rounds. Um, had a really good run at the players, which is also, you know, we, we've said this a couple of different times, a Pete die track, um, played well at Amex, a Pete die track, uh, 12th in this field and strokes gained approach over long term. I'm not sure what he is short term, but he's actually really solid around the green as well. Just a horrible putter, man. Um, you know, which, you know, there, there's, there's going to be some warts at, at 6,900. Um, uh, but Doug Gim certainly sticks out to me. Luke list is a guy that's, we know is a ball striker and has played well in this course on this course before Benny on, uh, man, it's just, it's kind of like a Miliano Grio to me, uh, with on only his, his strength is, you know, around the green. Um, so, you know, the, that's a, that's certainly a skill set we're looking at this week. Matthew Neesmith from the area, um, you know, kind of loves this course, kind of in that Matthew Fitzpatrick mold, kind of a well-known thing that Neesmith really digs, um, Harbor Town. So, I mean, I think you can look at him. His his iron game's been solid. Um, then you get down into these vets. Brant Snedeker uh, has, has played well here historically, and he always seems to just randomly pop up in a tournament a, a couple times a year. Uh, Doc Redmond, maybe he's getting back on track to look a little bit better at Valero. Uh, Russell Knox, another kind of one of those ball striker guys, and you got a you know a veteran like Stuart Sink, um, and a guy we really liked at Valero, uh, Spencer Chase Seifert. Um, so I mean, I think there's certainly some guys you can look at down here. I mean that that kind of takes you all the way down into like the Jim Furyk, Graham McDowell range, um, guys that have played really well here, veterans that, that know their way around this track. Um, so I think there's some playable options down here, starting with Gim and kind of working your way down, but. But give me your thoughts, man. Maybe toss a couple names at me um, that, that the folks listening might might not be super familiar with that, that, that you're considering this week. I don't believe I'm mistaken here. Um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe this is the venue where Matthew Neesmith proposed to his fiance, correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's right, man. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, he has good feels here. This is when we look at his 33rd place last season, if I recall correctly on that, I, I, I think he was leading or within the top couple after day one there. And, and, you know, that result kind of fell apart. I think I had a top 20 on him, which ended up not coming to fruition when, you know, he fell apart on the weekend, but yeah, I, he's alluded to this course being something that he likes a guy like Ryan Moore. I I'm always intrigued with when you add the win, he's a UNLV guy that, you know, I, I, I'm always interested in looking at, I think the recent form hasn't been quite as good, but from a statistical sense, he is 11th for me you know, that's at least worth considering. I mean, when we're down in this range, we're trying to target guys that at least can have some upside to him. Doug Gim, I, I am agreement with you on that. I think if we look at, you know, if we look at some of the stuff that he's done since the players, it hasn't been great. Probably took a little bit of wind out of his sails from what he was doing. It'll be his first test here, but you know, Gim's a guy with upside. Russell Knox is another guy where I can never seem to get on the right side of what Knox is doing. He has two straight miscuts cuts at this venue, but you know, a second in 2016 and 11th in 2017, another good win player, uh, Chase Seifert, as you mentioned, that's somebody that immediately popped out for me, you know, three, four straight top uh, 44 results, the third at the Honda, the 18th at Corrales. And then, you know, one of the biggest, um, differentiators in my model when I was looking at it from an ownership perspective from where my rank is. And this isn't a guy that I have, you know, making the cut that much above, you know, where he is right now, but I do have him making the cut. And as of right now, it's a half percent ownership on him would be Ben Martin, 34th at Valero, ninth at Corrales. I think he's bringing good form into this week. I think nobody's going to be on him. There are some concerns with the Pete Dye nature, the Bermuda nature behind his game, but He's a good win player. He's pretty good between the par four ranges that I'm looking at. He's uh, a good scrambler, um, you know, driving accuracy. He's 30th in my model. So 
he may be a guy that's able to sneak out a, a you know a top 20 25 finish and if you can get him at less than one percent i think that's an intriguing person and then you know I, I would be remiss not to at least mention him will gordon has insane upside it's just i, I just feel like trying to catch gordon on the right week is the problem you see these you know top tiered performances from him and then he follows it up with a 78 where he triple bogeys back to back holes and you're like well you know it was a fun ride while it lasted but you know young player who seems that it at any point he can turn it around and yeah i mean i think there's a handful of names you can target down in this range that do have upside to them spencer you fit right in on this show we've been we've been trying to catch the right side of will gordon for about a year so <laughs> welcome to the club uh we'll, we'll continue trying to crack the will gordon code we love we love him on the turn uh he's a vandy guy uh out of tennessee so we're, we're always pulling for will gordon uh but like you said you never know but i always seem to always seem to get him in a couple gpps just trying to catch that one hot week because you feel like there's a ton of talent there um with you on that as you work your way down bryce garnett's kind of a veteran knows his knows his way around this golf course uh and rafael campos is a name i'll throw out there just uh as we started getting into dart throw territory kind of a little little sleeper this week down there at 6400 um had top three finishes at, at puerto rico and then corrales um, then played okay at Valero, and he's got a T32 on his RBC Heritage resume, I think, back in 17, maybe. Um, so, you know, he's definitely a journeyman, but, you know, I'll toss Rafael Campos out there if you're looking for just a, you know, a GPP punt. Duffner, the boss tracking is always, uh, you know, kind of kind of uh, tempting, but we know the putting is very, very bad. Um, and that's that's about it for me, Spencer. It kind of, kind of runs out. I want to... I want to shout out Wesley Bryan. I always, you know, seem to want to give him a look, especially when he's this cheap. He's a he's a former Heritage champion. Um, just hadn't been able to make the starts this year, man, to kind of get going. We saw some flashes from him at the end of last year, but uh, I'll, I'll give him a little shout out here anyway. Um, John Augenstein um, is a guy that just turned pro also out of Vanderbilt, a guy that Andrew and I are familiar with. Very talented kid, but hadn't happened for him yet in just a couple of starts as a pro. But you can maybe give Augustine a look down there. And then Brian Gay is just a veteran that, you know, anytime that the distance is out of the equation, you might want to kind of circle Brian Gay. So that's really it for me. Um, is there anybody else for you down there in dart throw territory, Spencer? No, I mean, I think we're kind of, you know, it's going to take the – right or wrong lineup, however you want to look at it, to get down into this range here. A guy like Scott Piercy was somebody that intrigued me. Third here in 2019, 16th here in 2018. It's just, you know, we haven't seen him play very much recently. And when we have seen him play, he hasn't exactly impressed. Like, he hasn't missed the cut. 69th at the player, 64th at Genesis, 50th at Pebble Beach. Maybe you can look at him to be able to turn it around a little bit. We know that when he gets hot, he can get hot with the irons. He has been relatively good recently, even with it. He's 34th in his last 24 rounds in approach. He's 24th in his last 24 rounds around the green, which is a big improvement from my two-year model, which has him 92nd. So, you know, if the short game's good, the irons are dialed in. He's 30th in my model in Bermuda. Like, there are certain aspects that would make me believe that Piercy has the ball-striking nature in the irons to – you know, give you a made cut, maybe do a little bit more at 6,300. But yeah, I mean, as you said, this is dart throw te territory. This isn't necessarily w where I want to be. There's a couple guys, those shorter hitters, like the gays of the world that have a chance, you know, Duffner is a ball striker that maybe he can give you a made cut, give you a little bit more, but it, it's not really the range I want to be in if I can avoid it. Yeah. Um, I think there's enough quality this week that you don't have to go down there. Um, you, you, so I, I certainly won't be going out of my way to go down there, uh, when we start talking about the mid sixes and lower, um, but, you know, there's a couple of guys that I'll, that I'll be considering the upper sixes and certainly the sevens. Um, there's a lot of solid options in the sevens. Um, you know, we, we went through the kind of the entire salary scale, um, touched on some really good options, kind of, kind of, you know, tried to parse it out a little bit. Um, this is a unique golf course, a unique event, and a, and a really strong field, man. We uh, we love this golf tournament. Um, so with that said, Spencer, we're heading to Hilton Head this week. RBC Heritage. 
What is your heart play of the week? Where's your heart at this week, Spencer? We got to close out the show with a heart play. Well, this might come as a shock. I am going to go with my heart play and my mind play here. I will say Tommy Fleetwood wins his first PGA Tour event here, finally gets over the hurdle. Okay. Okay. I lock it. I lock it. That's, that was kind of an Andrew lock uh, <laughs> heart play. Um, yeah. I know Andrew would want to say Chris Kirk. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna make Andrew's heart play Chris Kirk. You had him at Valero, so we're 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 chalking him up for, for Chris Kirk this week. Um mm, I'm going really close to you on the salary scale there, Spencer. I wanna go Matt Fitzpatrick. Um I like answer this week a lot. Um as we've talked we spend a lot of time talking about answer. Um I really like Colin Morikawa for some reason. Well, I know the reason the ball striking, but uh, Matt Fitzpatrick's played really well this year, man. I, I felt that a win's coming, um, and this is the type of track uh, where it's likely to happen, you know, in my opinion. A, a shorter track, a track that's going to, you know, test short game putting. Um, so my heart's with Matthew Fitzpatrick. That's that's who I'm going with this week. Um, I like it. Yeah, man. Hopefully, hopefully something will come through there. Um, Spencer, I, I appreciate you joining us this week, man. We we really love having you on, and 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 you're welcome anytime with us. Um, had, had a great master show last week. A ton of listeners uh, tuned in, and we really appreciate everything you bring to the show. Um, we we appreciate you guys listening. Had a great uh, Masters week last week, and and really excited about kind of the hat giveaways and the the subscribers, all you guys that are adding on YouTube and following us on the uh, Apple podcast and Spotify. Uh, can't, can't tell you how much we appreciate that. Great talking with y'all. We'll see you next week. Have a good one. It's gonna try.